Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Going to look at Frank Miller's Sin City, a, uh, a Sin City yarn, Family Values. Uh, before we do, I want to invite everybody to like, follow, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell icon next to the subscribe button. You'll be notified when we post new videos and it'll give you a leg up on the competition if you're trying to track down the, the books that we're showcasing. We call it the Kayfabe Effect. Uh, people go out scoop up these copies of books so if uh, you hit that notification button you'll be the first ones in line looking for these books also let the video play through to the end that'll allow youtube to uh, share the video with other comics fans who haven't found cartoonist kayfabe yet that's how we grow the channel and we appreciate your help on that thank you very much so ed Frank Miller's Family Values. We've been talking Will Eisner, Frank Miller conversation. This book comes up a lot in there. I read it whenever it came out, 1997 publication date. Haven't read it since then. Reading that interview made me want to go back and kind of visit this as uh, really like Miller's first graphic novel in terms of doing it all in one big piece, um, which is a different approach. You know, he talks about it in that interview of flying blind, right? You know, he, he created this whole book and then sent it to the editor. So kind of interesting, you know, he really waxes on about that process and how this is different. I don't know if he had a page count in mind when he started it, but a different approach to storytelling for him. So I was kind of eager to, to revisit this after 20 years. Yeah. Even as this book was being promoted, that was the idea that was in mind. This is going to be a graphic novel. This is going to be one complete thing. And yes, there was Contract with God, that was a multi, you know, 100 plus page book, but there really wasn't that much of that. It would be the understood thing of like this six issue miniseries is going to be collected into a book. Right. Uh, the, the Marvel DC quote unquote graphic novels, 60 pages, whatever. Maybe you get Why I Hate Saturn and it's 120 pages or something, which is an interesting thing, but you didn't get very much of this from, from, uh, from this kind of cartoonist, uh, even also. the stuff that was like one coherent story, you know, I think of like, um, like a velvet glove cast in iron, Dan Klaus, eight ball cereal and the other Sin City books that you mentioned, you know, yeah. being one big story, but they were still broken up in a way where it was like cliffhanger at the yeah. end of each issue, yeah. you know, and, and kind of a splash page, a big opener in the beginning. So you definitely had that structure to consider and it's not in here, right? which is interesting. Um, Lynn Varley on colors here on the cover, probably towards the end of her doing like a painted style coloring with him, you know, Dark Knight Returns or Dark Knight Strikes Back, all digital. So not a lot of Lynn Varley coloring uh, beyond this. Yeah, the rest will be, uh, I think 300 might be after this, mm -hmm. but also Helen back when there's the psychedelic drug scenario. I think she colors that. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then, uh, then it's done. Uh, look at Miho, look at that face, right? Yeah. Like, like, uh, that that's adventurous for, for your cover, I feel like. Man, it's very rough. Yeah, it's funny because we say, get the wheels off the ground to show speed. G get the entire Miho off the car to, again, show show that speed in action. This is, uh, this is Frank Miller, like, leaning into, like, Bigfoot cartooning. Mm -hmm. Down to, like, these characters with these obscene giant noses and weird-shaped heads and Miho's feet. It, I mean, it's Bigfoot cartooning. I did not like this when it came out. Yeah. I quit buying Sin City in the middle of Helen back. Uh -huh. Like I was, I basically, that's when I check out of Frank Miller. Um, so again, interesting to go back and see this because I remember it a certain way. Yeah. And reading it, uh, honestly, it's very different than I remembered it. Yeah. Like, you know, when you were reading it, like you were still more of a, a fan of comics than, than like, you know, like, like a full blown, like maker of comics and stuff. And I feel like, as a like fans have expectations and stuff and they they want to they want to see you bleed on the page man and there is a drawing style that he was using when he was getting that little dopamine spike of having an issues worth of material come out at a time so uh this is the first time i was conscious of feeling like the artist was conscious that they had were on on page 1 of 125 or something so they're moving around like a whole bunch of pages, drawing with a little more speed and things. It's a different approach, approach he uses here. And he further further pushes the art... Playboy New York Times. Yeah, good uh, stuff. Full quotes. He, he further pushes the art to places of like uh, abstraction more and more, like in, in Hell and Back. And then the ultimate examples of that would be Dark Knight Strikes Again and that, um, that like 
other uh, uh, holy terror or whatever like where it's just like one one line t- gets taken away you don't know what the hell you're even looking at <laughs> right this is um a time too whenever i'm still like my favorite miller at this point is still that first sin city mm-hmm. and it's there's very little line yeah there's a lot more line in here. There are moments when it reminds me of Ronan, which was yeah. tons of lines. And I'll point those out as we see like some hatching and stuff. But he was bringing some stuff into this drawing wise that I just wasn't ready for. Yeah, it's very like it's a lot of white. It's it's <laughs> think, think of the white media in that first Sin City where uh-huh. it's rain and stuff. This is a whole different approach even to that white media. Here's the thing though, because like look at Miho, dude. Like she gets the clear line approach yes. throughout this whole thing. You know, she gets the clear line. I like that. Me too. It, because it's almost like a version of um Asterios Polyp where like the characters get their own kind of uh aesthetic. It it makes her super light too for like a ninja assassin. That kind of clear line in this world, she's almost a ghost. Yeah. He is really good at launching you into the world really fast. With these two pages, like you're you're there, you're you're on board immediately. And he's going crazy. Again, like, you know, we've seen him do snow with the white media. I don't even know what this is. It's some meteor shower or something <laughs> happening. <laughs> it is our, definitely a turbulent night. Our arguments of sleet and hail. <laughs> yes. I like the attention to car detail, too. You know, clearly a Volkswagen bug here uh, rolling through the snow. Poor Dwight, not a good vehicle. And uh, right away, we're in here. He's at a scene of, of a massacre from the night before. Cool bullet holes, you know, through the glass windows, and he's just kind of checking it out. Um, the ability to do these kind of compositions where it's all silhouette, gotta love it. It reads perfectly. Yeah, he got his 10,000 hours practicing on, on doing this kind of stuff, so it's like, this is a this is a bar, you know? Like, these are stools, and it's just shapes. So he's tricking your brain, and it's so freaking cool. But uh, go see our Art of uh, Sin City book, and you see that, that he draws these things pretty fleshed out. It, it looks like the style that he drew Daredevil comics in when he's in the earliest stages and then he just whittles it down further and further this art style in this book it feels like it's his peak mick mcmahon kind of shit like when when you see the bigfoot uh judge dread stuff that mick mcmahon did it's the same kind of line approach it's it's like spotting the blacks first and in kind of like having these little noodle marks to accentuate them I never hear him reference Mick McMahon, but I swear to God, I can make a, a strong argument. We need to look at, at some of his stuff. Like, like that's a guy that I've tracked down various comics over the years and draws in a variety of styles. Yeah, Definitely at least uh, three periods deserving of, of some attention. The, the scratchy lines, though, too, just look like scribbles almost. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was just something I was not ready to see at that time. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it required, like, certain kind of... Art styles, man, they require a, like a, a little more sophistication, a little more awareness. They're they're for a more learned eye than uh, just you know fanboy du jour. I was really impressed with his gloves and hands. You know, notoriously hard to draw hands. So anytime I see a good set, I, I'm impressed by them. And so Dwight's scoping out this uh, shot up diner, this murder scene. Whenever this cop comes around for a second, a second sweep through. You got a mohair coat on, man. It costs about a thousand and you're rolling around in Herbie the Love Bug. Doesn't add up. <laughs> this, this cop's playing Sherlock Holmes and something's wrong here. Yeah, man. But then she's getting randy about it. So he's got to dispatch that the best way he, he can. And here's that good juxtaposition of the Miho clear line with the sort of scratchiness of the rest of the scene. Yeah, and some cool drawing. For a minimal kind of drawing, we've got this perspective of clearly this is our extreme foreground uh, without really anything extra. Very stripped down. Some of these silhouettes are just... Uh, that's wild looking. Some some bold choices yeah. on, on how he's representing these silhouettes. Yeah, it's good. And, and the way he dispatches the, this cop, because this lady's very flirtatious, man, and, and really into him. So he's got a... He's got a get get out of this because miho is overzealous like she's ready to go yes and he knows it i love that he tilts the lettering and the panel of like okay cool your jets miho like this is stuff is wrong and here's the dutch angle to prove it So he turns on the uh, the freak charm, and she decides this is not the guy for her. Yeah, it's really cool, man. Like like uh, he turns her off in in two seconds with like th- you know th- two sentences. Yeah, it gets pretty creepy with ideas on the uh, what to do with those handcuffs. 
I like the interior of this bar. I found this to be very realistic. Again, minimal details, but I mean, I've seen bars that look like this. Sure. Reads very clearly. It's funny, too, that the cars are from such different eras. Like, it's a mashup of different time periods in terms of the cars that everybody drives. Yeah, which which I appreciate because, like, like when I draw cars... There's nothing less interesting than a modern Honda Civic or something. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? Like, draw draw those old cars. What the fuck? And draw your bartender with this, like, obscene penis nose that just gets bigger every panel. What the heck? <laughs> I'm sure as a kid this is one of those things I'm looking at going, is he even trying? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. But but this this is the absurdity that you would see in, like, a, the Mick McMahon, Judge Dredd stuff from the period I'm speaking about. Because he does have several... McMahon does have several eras of Judge Dredd and just drawing in general, but there's like a sweet spot that the Venn diagram overlaps in a big way between Miller and... I like the pattern of like that half drape up the window. And this reminds me again of the Eisner-Miller conversations of just what do you need prop-wise to sell this stuff? Because yeah. like those glasses hanging upside down, that's about as simple as you can get in cartooning. But that's what it reads like. I don't think anybody would have any question what they're looking at in that drawing. That's one of the cool things that they that they uh, are able to to inject into the movies is is that kind of stuff. Also, that fat man and little boy character are uh, are in the movies also and handled really well. <laughs> These two. Yeah, yeah. How they're just snooping and narking. Yeah. Every panel. Every time you see them. And Look at that man. It's almost like a heart. Yeah, Miller playing with page layouts and stuff like like this is probably stuff I wouldn't have appreciated first first read through, but like it more now. And again, playing with this Dutch angle is Dwight's really manipulating this woman, yeah. and everybody knows it, including her. Right, and it's such a kind of a scummy, you know, exchange that they all participate in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's going to get to a point though where. Miller's going to get Eisnerian with uh, his panel layouts. And when you get these moments where there's just like lucidity or something and you get a standard six panel grid, it's very jarring when you, when you just have the regular grid in the midst of all these other sorts of layouts. And there's your probably maximum nose. That's ridiculous. That is insane, man. It's beyond Chester Gold. Yes. Although you gotta imagine Chester Gold's on, in, in Miller's uh, lexicon. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comics that Ed Piscor and I make. So here's a rundown of what is available. Hulk, Grand Design, Monster, and Madness, a retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, is available in comic shops everywhere right now, including some very cool variant covers by Peach Momoko, Jeff Darrow, Ed McGinnis, Marcos Martin, and cartoonist Kayfabe's own Ed Piscor, in addition to my covers. You can also find The Deadly Scroll Live, Street Angel, and a variety of oversized hardcovers from Image Comics, Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard, and The Plain Janes, the first young adult graphic novels published here in the United States about a bunch of high school artists that get in trouble around their town doing public art. From Ed Piscor, Red Room, the antisocial network collecting the first series of uh, Red Room Comics, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, Trigger Warnings, Red Room's second season now in stores, two or three issues available already, and uh, a fourth one on the way coming soon. Banned in uh, 22 countries and 10 comic book shops, but those shops will still order these comics. You just may have to ask for them by name. They may come uh, out from under the counter whenever you ask for those, wrapped in a brown paper bag. He's also the originator of the Grand Design series. There are three oversized, beautiful volumes of X-Men Grand Design currently available wherever books and comics are bought and sold, as well as Hip Hop Family Tree, four oversized volumes of this hip hop history and available in deluxe box sets, very nice box sets, and WYSIWYG, a history of computer hacking available wherever books and comics are sold. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Yeah, this flashback sequence, this is like that that Will Eisner stuff where he's like, I'm not going to be using panel borders in this in this comic. Yeah, I, I mean, I like this stuff a lot more on the reread, you know, in terms of visual. It doesn't feel like he's phoning it in, even though I think some of the drawings look like they're done maybe quickly or sparsely or whatever. It's still, I mean, that's a lot of stuff going on on this page. However... It's all exposition. So reading, it's kind of uh, 
you know, maybe the reading, it's more of a problem than looking at it. The second, the second read through for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he's in and out and he uses the, the perfect purple prose to, to keep it fun for me. It's, um, it's a, it's a very limited story. Like I could imagine the story being told in eight pages. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward on point. You're not getting a lot of subplots. You're not getting those like <laughs> artificial cliffhangers. You know what it is, man? Like, and he, and I guess he talks about it a little bit in the book. Um, but he's expanded on it in years since where like family values is he's sick and tired. Like, you know, big proponent of like, fuck the comics code, all of that stuff. I'm sick of hearing about our children. I don't have children. I'm making comics for, you know, for, I'm not making comics for people who are not there. Uh, I'm making comics for, you know, the people that I want. And he's looking at the idea of family in every way but the nuclear mm -hmm. standard family. So we're talking mob families. We're talking re relationship dynamics between brothers. That, that is sketchy. Uh, there is... Um, I've been reading Andrew Vax, and he was at Dark Horse at this time. Jeff Darrow connected with Andrew Vax. Jeff Darrow connected with Frank Miller. I'm assuming that uh, Frank Miller read some of the Burke books. And the, and the linchpin of the Burke series is the idea of chosen family, where... Like fuck your biological family if they're if they're heels and they're pieces of shit fuck them right. like you have your chosen family that you'll die for and stuff like that so there are elements of that in here and then of course the uh, spoiler at the end is you know the lesbian dynamic between right. the two girls so it's everything that's not just your standard conservative nuclear regular family. We talked about cars earlier. This is a Lamborghini. This is the, the people who do the shootout. We're going to learn later it's not a Lamborghini. It's a very it's cool a piece. It's unreliable narrator, yeah. if you will. So that's kind of fun. And because just, we are in like flashback mode. You know, we're telling this story of what happened at that diner last night. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's it's her memory. And it's yeah, just, and it's this drunk it, lady from the bar who's fucking, once again drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was probably drunk the night she saw this and not definitely drunk on her retelling of it. How fun is it to just put holes in a dude like a, like a goddamn cartoon character? That's yes. what I'm talking about. This is Bigfoot cartooning, like even this kind of stuff. It definitely is. You know, these kind of bugged out eyes and stuff. Bigfoot's the right word for it, but there's definitely other visual language, you know, some of the cross hatching, um, just some of the textures, you know, it's stuff that isn't necessarily found in the other Sin City books uh, before this. Yeah, even when he's doing Clean Line, it's still this like ugly, thick and thin I love it. line. Yeah, me too. Very alive. You know, I mean, that's a pen nib line, I assume. Uh-huh. Yeah, with just the wobbliest hand. Yeah, it's kind of cool that he brings the line back in this. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, like the textures on this on his coat, I mean, there's scribbles, but there are a variety of scribbles there. Some of these thick lines, I don't know what kind of tools. It feels like he's using at least a couple of different in drawing instruments there. Yeah. Not yeah. to mention some white media once again. Yeah, yeah, of course, man. Uh, but that's just a great juxtaposition between his clear line approach and the grid of of sin city like he's saying a lot about miho she's like she's she's like an angel or something mm -hmm. because she because the clear line on her with no shadow but like the face it signifies a light yeah luminescent and i mean again the white media the splatter i don't know if there's splatter in previous sin city stuff it's really uh i don't know he really feels like he's bringing it i think i think babe Red red one shot would have been out before this uh, Big Fat Kill also. I'm not sure. I think Yellow Bastard comes out after. Okay. I'm not 100% sure. The bricks, much less formed. You know, that first Sin City, it feels like there are panels where it's almost ruled out perspective to get those bricks all perfect in an alleyway. And here it's like, let me just draw these in with uh, <laughs> with this white paint. <laughs> so uh, he, he did all that bullshit in the bar just so that the fat man and little guy... Mr. Schlub or whatever, uh, heard them so that they can narc them out. <laughs> and now this is like that, uh, Batman Robin cover. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I like this part. So he, he gets the information from this lady that he needs, you know, we're in this silhouette, kind of a cool, you know, his panel arrangements have always been pretty good, I think. And now this is her leaving and she's now stepped into the shadow of it's that good. black alley as, as she goes away. Really simple. But like visually that tells you everything. Mm -hmm. And again, nobody's misreading what's happening there. This was a sequence that they pulled out in that Eisner Miller conversation and, and one that really made me want to check this out. And it's Dwight getting hit by this large Cadillac in, in spread over several pages. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's an interesting approach because you could uh, call back Sin City 1 with Marv when he's getting jacked up by the same car and getting hit a bunch of times. And it's the same amount of pages, but it's a different effect. This is slowing time down as the dude's rolling up and uh, gonna gonna kiss pavement. Great with the your angles and stuff, almost an arrow as you're reading across, you know, like being shot by this arrow. But then you look at the bricks and even on the ground, like the cobblestones, these are just visual, you know, like that's just a texture to sort of accentuate the, the roughness, the rough and tumble part. Yeah. I like that. That's very abstract. It's interesting to create like mood and stuff from those types of marks. Now we got to get into our uh, noir, like beat the shit out of our anti-hero hero. Yeah, yeah. And it's good too, man, because because Dwight like no sells everything and is just like, well, I'm going to kill you guys in about 10 minutes. He's like, I'm, I'm excited for that car. Yeah, I'm going to be driving that car. You see what I was, I'm riding around to her be the love bug, man. <laughs> Getting kicked in the face and being like, this is my lucky day. <laughs> it's so, it's, it's so silly tone wise, that kind of stuff. I mean, it all is really, but but then when you read Mickey Spillane, mm -hmm. same deal, same deal. Like all the stories are like when you break it down are like super simple, and it's just about the journey and like having fun along the journey and using using uh, fun uh, like uh, descriptions. You know, the cobblestones vibrate my head like my teeth are gonna f come out of my skull, like that th that type of shit. Like it's just butch talk. Like his lettering effects. And he can't help himself on the choreography, right? Like here we're swinging from right to left. The next one we're coming back across from left to right. Like one of the things he's known for in Daredevil is, is good choreography, choreography that makes sense, something that was not the norm in superhero comics at the time. And, you know, you see that consistency here. And I like this page layout. The white background of the page bleeds right into Miho where it's like, oh yeah, this is a splash page with some inset panels on top of it. He does this great stuff in A Big Fat Kill where you get the uneven brick of the facade of a building with Dwight like climbing up it. And uh, the fact that, like, you know, he's not really worried about placing these eyeballs in an academically correct way. Like, when I see the eyes like that, I start to think of, like, Reggie Byers, man. Yeah, interesting. Straight yeah. shuriken. Yeah, it's, it is total cartoon eye. That's great. You know, he didn't mention it, at least I don't remember that in the Eisner conversation, but the idea of working on this book as spreads. But clearly he does because we have two-page spreads in different places. So, you know, he, he, he has to be conscious of that. But it makes me wonder, like, how he's thinking. Because he did yeah. talk about, like, working on lots of the pages at once. Right. So, you know, are they all laid out as spreads? I'd be, I'd be kind of curious about how he thinks of that. Because I've done both, you know, like with the Hulk... I'm doing single pages, and as a result, you know, you can put an ad on page three and it doesn't mess anything up. Yeah. But in the past, I've done a lot of books as, like, two-page spreads, you know, like the Street Angel stuff where I'm controlling that. And uh, he's got to be aware of it just because of the two-page spreads that pop up from time to time. But it's really neat to see that, you know, like, even having black background, white background, you know, I've done spreads that way where you're just trying to make these things fit, you know, and make, make them fit next to each other. And again... The clear line, white silhouette, really, of Miho as she's uh, pursuing them. Yeah, when you see her with, like, knives and stuff, like, the things that she interacts with become clear line also. You know, that contrast with the white space being exterior versus your darks inside the car? It all works pretty well. I remember this being, like, a strange choice to me. Yeah. But kind of cool. I, I like that part. Like, going back through it again, it's like, yeah, put her on wheels. It, it somehow <laughs> it makes her even, like, faster, more deadly, more interesting. And also, if you get kicked with those, much more damage. Which we're going to see. <laughs> I always think a roller girl in Boogie Nights just stomping that dude in the face with roller skates. Yeah. Not good. And you can't help but think of Elektra. Yeah, and also the Carrie Kelly, Dark Knight Strikes Again version of, of uh, Robin cat girl whatever she's called in there i was trying to think of like when stephen platt is drawing a uh, double lit shell casings yeah in profit and you know like such an alternative version of that even though it's essentially the same thing just unloading a machine gun jimmy this is the stuff that really captivated me with his style uh with the no holding lines just pure uh stark shadow and things and this would be the stuff that like a lot of the style biters mm -hmm. would would copy off him they would just kind of do this thing but it would get 
real muddy. And it's once, hard to do that. Once again, just pointing out the straight up bullet holes that yeah. I love. Um, should note, you know, Miho's getting into the trunk there. That's what we're seeing in like these five panels across here. To me, I put that in the uh, choreography category of like, okay, yeah, that all, we, we saw it all. It was very clear <laughs> how that works. Which seems like it might not be the funnest thing to draw, but it, he made it look very cool. Inventive page layouts. I say, you know, I've said it several times, but I mean, it's worth noting. If, if you're doing this kind of sparse style, like, I think you got to make every piece count. So when Dwight was at the, the crime scene, he was trying to put things together kind of like a, like a detective. Oh, yeah, totally. And, and once this little piece of information right here about the stray dog uh, gets relayed to him, he knows the exact score. He knows the layout. He knows where that dog was. Uh, so that is where the most important incident in the book occurred. So now he, now Miho can come into play. You know, after after 64 pages, Miho doesn't have to hold back any longer. Yeah, and I think it's a smart move. You have the dog go in there, and guess what? Now you're totally sympathetic as a reader to the uh, Dwight's cause, right? Some guy just callously shoots the dog. We don't care about shooting up the diner and killing a bunch of people, but you killed the dog. So it's the classic move, man. Yeah, cheap, cheap heat. It is cheap heat, totally. Cheap heat, man. You're on Dwight's side. Now let's... Uh... Let's give these guys their comeuppance. And uh, and here we go, man. Now he's telling Miho, all right, time time to go. Go easy on the upholstery. And they're like, what are you talking? What's going on? You're <laughs> talking crazy, talking to yourself. And these were always weird moments. I think there's one in, I want to say Big yellow. Fat kill. Okay, where, where the gun like breaks and it ends up with a piece of gun lodged in his forehead. Yeah, what was, uh, like, yeah, that was that was Jackie Boy from, from Big Fat Kill. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of the same awkward, like through the through the head, behind the ear, and out the eyebrow. Yeah, what I thought you were gonna say, like 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 Miho does some car gimmicks with knives and stuff with with Jackie Boy's homies, <laughs> like swords just come straight down into a dude's eye. I remember. It's only in the movie. This guy folds quick, but I guess if your buddy gets a knife, gets a sword through the head while you're sitting there, maybe you are nervous. And he says there's a sword in his back. Right. So. Yeah, that's that classic lecture joint where she's just just push it right against that spine man like it doesn't it's not going to take much more how bold is that for a face oh yeah that could be rorschach yeah and so back to two page spread which means he's got to at least be conscious of how the spreads are falling mm -hmm. that's a pretty fun one too you know they're up on this i don't know some kind of cliff but you get this perspective above some of the buildings nearby it's pretty good <laughs> this guy gets out talking tough it's ridiculous. I feel like this is uh, <laughs> this is the dude from Street Angel Gang with the football helmet on. It right. just is <laughs> not effective at all. <laughs> <laughs> and just, I mean, like as a piece of cartooning, like look at that guy, you know? Just like a little frog. Mm -hmm. A little frog in a huge contrast between her snow white, almost uh, in, uh, transparent, versus his uh, silhouette coming at her. Good, his, good splash page. He's got a sweater that his mom knitted him. <laughs> and he just gets his ass handed to him over and she over. She doesn't break a sweat, this girl. The way he twists that figure, man. Like, it's real fun seeing him him like show off his, his figure drawing skills. And just like this kind of shit. It's nearly Hokusai. It also looks like Mitch O'Connell or something. It's In the silhouettes of everybody else, I mean, that's a rectangle for a car. Yeah. Almost like a, a coffin. Yeah. That's like a, a good grave call. setup. And look at her, dude. Just like like nothing. You know, this is hands fun folded. Because it's like down and up, you know, left or right if you were throwing punches. Just keep this thing moving. Yeah, she's just dancing all around him. <laughs> and gesturing. <laughs> Throws him the sword and is like, come on. You could just tell that Miller loves the Miho character. Pro Absolutely. Probably more than everybody. Anybody that does superhero comics, you have to love a character like this, right? I mean, it's a dancer. It's just this this person that's flying around. 
and Dwight just admiring it, you know. This is everybody reading the comic. <laughs> but then it does get to the point where, like, this is revolting. <laughs> like, this guy's gurgling and, like, shooting blood every... Like, can you just be done with it? It does go on for quite a, quite a long time. There goes the brother killing his other brother and just, like, taking half his damn head off. Wrap it up, Miho. We're running late. This is revolting. That's just a funny word to use for the situation. Yeah, there's your gargling. <laughs> the guy just leaking. <laughs> and, I mean, so empty. Even the, the way, like, the folds and stuff are almost, like, blowing in the wind. Beautiful lips. Real good at drawing lips. And then just punt. She she started it off, you know, she she, she loosened the lid a little bit mm -hmm. with that uh, ninja star and just finish it. Yeah, and kicks his head off and then lands smoothly on the next page. Like, it's, it's again, perfect spread. Works really well. And this guy's out of his mind at this point. He's shot his brother. He's had a sword in his back. So this dude get his head kicked seen off? Seen this little girl just destroy all of his uh, big heavyweights. And now she's sleeping like a cat on Dwight's lap. And he still has it in mind that he's going to get one over on these people. And this is one of my favorite sequences. And and this is this is an argument where he is completely conscious of like the two page spread. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a beautiful sequence. Where she just clicks it. And it's two different drawings for those playing at home. I was comparing ink lines. It's really interesting too because we go from this higher angle, right? Like, okay, maybe he can get the drop on him to straight on to the low angle as like his power just diminishes. Yeah. Full impotence. That's pretty interesting drawing for uh, this wealthy mansion, kind of a mid-century modern Frank, Frank Lloyd, Lloyd, right? Yeah, exactly. Gym. Yeah. But it's interesting to see Miller applying this kind of style to architecture. It's something he's always been good at, man. Those like terracotta roof textures, like in Dame to Kill for, like, good luck. This feels like the art of Frank Miller or the art of Sin City book because you can see his knee mm -hmm. under that coat very clearly. And if you look in that art of Sin City, you see all that underdrawing. Right. He'll draw the full figure uh, in, in like a pencil or like a, or like a black line. And then in like a different color Sharpie on a piece of tracing paper, he'll start to like find where all the folds are. Lightbox both pieces. I think he does both of those things on tracing paper. Lightboxes both to the final board and then just gets into this reductive stuff. I love this spread because we are almost copying like the architecture as your page layout, you know, yeah. rather than just doing grid. And you could have done grids here, but chooses not to. And you can see those shapes repeating over here. And then also, like I mentioned, the brick motif earlier, which is so common in Sin City. And it's these abstract bricks now. It feels almost like 70s Marvel or something to me in the background. Yeah, and you see these kind of bricks, man. Mm -hmm. It's like on a facade of the Brady Bunch house or something. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's a whole different interpretation of the Sin City Brick Alley. That's a pretty good image of her. You know, we've seen a bunch of splash pages. None of them look like that. Really highlights her white again against that black background. Thump, thump, thump. <laughs> Just dragging this dude with a goddamn scythe <laughs> through his head. That's right. Jeez. He's about 300 and she's about one. Yeah, I think that, that knife might just cut through his head if she tried pulling him <laughs> by it, but suspension of disbelief. I love it, man. Part I'm, of storytelling. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. And they're going in to track down this crime boss who had ordered that initial hit, just, in case anybody lost the straightforward plot. Just dispatching everybody along the way. Like, I like this one, where they're walking, and the chain just comes up in between them, and they're like, huh? And then it just goes and grabs some dude up ahead of them. Yeah, it's a nasty looking weapon. Yeah, like nearly that, like a uh, flying guillotine type shit. Feels so much like wrestling poses. You know how like like uh, guys sell moves and stuff based right, on yeah. like you're gonna fall down, but it's gonna look like I made you fall down. Like it feels like there's so much of that in these uh, faux faux like physics or something. <laughs> that guy just bent in half. <laughs> Again, great contrast between her white and those silhouettes. And just like just her touching him makes his eyes get all big. And the body falling into this meeting of crime bosses. That's a pretty good entrance. 
wonder if this is a better, if it's a right-hand page. Mm. Yeah, I know what you mean. Because that would be good to turn to. And speaking of no selling, man, this crime boss is is not too impressed by any of this. By by, by a two hundred fifty pound dude dropping in his coffee table. I mean, he's having a straight up meeting with the most important dudes, like, and he's just wearing his like Hugh Hefner gimmick. He doesn't give a fuck, dude. It's true. But he's gonna learn. The hitman guy that that sells him out. <laughs> glass right in the face. <laughs> And, and uh, I am the soul of forgiveness. <laughs> Pulling his cane knife out to uh, get rid of that guy. And he's like, nope, not yours to kill. Put it away. That's kind of a fun move of uh, rendering that dude impotent. Like, you're not even allowed to kill your uh, your lackeys. Mm -hmm. Cutting off the hand. And we get the recap of what exactly went down. So, back to your lesbian love story, Ed. This uh, This girl... Talking on the phone, talking on the uh, the pay phone for everybody at home that's like, what? What kind of phone is she on? You used to put a quarter into a machine <laughs> and you could talk on it. And whenever this guy doesn't shut up, takes one in the kneecap. Soften him up. Let him know who's in charge. And uh, here we go. Shooting up your, your chauffeur. I think we've seen him pump full of holes now like three times. Yeah. Got <laughs> his eyeball ripped out. Keeps dying over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> it was when you shot the stray dog that the bullet went through and killed our girl and this girl like uh with the, those earrings that's the uh i think that's the sellout girl from uh from big fat kill man like see we didn't do big fat kill yet we got to do that one but there's a girl that sells out the uh the old town chicks. I didn't. Uh, yeah, I, I don't even remember that. That's she, another one. It's been a while since she, I read it. She's got these earrings, man. Interesting. So I think that might be her. That was. I always liked that in the Sin Cities how he would play that game. Of, yeah. Uh, you know, having characters walk through each other's stories. Sometimes and stuff. the same scene. Yeah. Poor, poor Weevil gets gets a. Uh... That was such a mind blower because it was like after the first Sin City, Marv's dead. But Marv's alive then in a dame to kill for, and, and really does just pass through bars and stuff like that at times. It was such a uh, different approach to, like, a universe. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. It's actually something I'm, I'm, I'm being very mindful of in my in my Red Room comics, where, like, I introduced the, the initial guy from issue one, and then, like, two issues later, like, he's in, he's in prison, and, like, you don't see any of that. And then in the issue I'm working on now, like, it's, like, leading up to, like, life in prison and, like, what happened after. Like, just... Yeah. You can bypass certain things and just play with it. If you're one person creating a universe, you don't have the benefits of five monthly books or something. You got to figure out your own ways. And and it's it's a cool thing to do because because the reader implies certain things and can, and can dream up certain scenarios and stuff. You want to draw the, all the cool stuff. Like yeah. knowing knowing those details allows you to do that. Yeah, and 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 you you do that enough times like like the timeline like you strictly abide by it and you know where like all the um sequences fall fall into place stray bullets works that way yes. like 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 sort of the layout with with Sin City and stray bullets is is sort of like my biggest i think all good stories do that yeah you know like they fit all the pieces fit if you go back and reread them it's like oh yeah those pieces th those line up right you know it's 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 tarantino's influence i think with the non-linear Storytelling of like Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, and things where where Vince Vega, the, your main guy, like like I think that was like the whole thing. Like Harvey Weinstein's like you, you're killing your main guy in the middle. No, nah, keep reading the script. Keep reading the script. Oh, he's gonna come back, huh? Right. Um, we should say that the, the final payoff, of course, is he tracks down the killers of, of her lover and basically delivers those killers to her. Yeah. So that's that's your end. And as Dwight walks away, they scream, they beg. One of them blubbers like a baby, <laughs> you know. Look at the mark making on this page. Yeah. That is some stuff we haven't seen in Sin City before. I mean, that is Goseki Kojima. There are fingerprints yeah. in the ink. Yeah, he does that, man. This is Goseki Kojima, Lone Wolf and Cub. I got to do 20 pages a week. Kind Which, of more of that Ronin callback. Yeah. You know, like some of the line work in here, it really does remind me of that. Yeah, totally, man. Uh, so this is where it, the idea of like the Burke... Andrew Vax chosen family thing is explored like right here. Like he's a chosen family member of that girl. Like that's how those Burke books work. So I think that he might've uh, discovered some of that material and 
you know, is doing his version of that. Yeah. And, and even talking about there's going to be hell to pay for this. The families will assume that boss man Wallenquist is responsible and go to war. So again, another, another family. How, how do you work family into this yes. as many uh, different angles as possible? That Wallenquist, like, you know how there's the Rourkes, right? And they have a certain level of power, but then above them is Wallenquist who kind of is beyond the machinations of everything. It's, he's never really been explored in Sin City. And I, and like, you just know that Miller has something in mind. Now with that second Dame to Kill for the mo- the second Sin City movie, you get a whole complete new Sin City story in there. It's the Nancy story of like her revenge and stuff. And Walla Quist fall, falls in, in with that a little bit. But uh, you just know that Miller ha- has notes about this oh, guy. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Uh, love the ending, of course. Dwight gets that car that he's been talking about <laughs> throughout the story. <laughs> How he's gonna look for, looking forward to driving this thing, and it handles like a dream. Go to the front cover and see if that's the exact like light box of the same image, man. Burn it into your mind, people. No, no, no different, different angles, different perspective, different angles for sure. Different, different uh, tire treads and stuff like that. Fun to reread, man. Interesting to go through it. Uh, you know, I don't know that Miller's done a graphic novel quite like this. I know Holy Terror is is uh, you know was published as a graphic novel, but I don't know what that was intended as originally. You know, I mean, for a while it was a Batman book, so it's hard to tell like how that book sort of shaped and formed around it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be you know come back and do more of these, Frank. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Please, man. And you know, he what? seems so gung ho in that Eisner in that Eisner book. You know, talking about working this way. We're, I mean, listen. If anything, like, we got to go back and do the rest of the Sin City books over time anyhow ourselves, dude. You good to go? Um, You know what? One last comment. So many silhouettes in here. Have you ever heard Miller talk about Alex Toth? Never. Uh, It makes me really curious because some of that stuff, I mean, is so Tothian in my mind, especially like some of the foregrounds where it's a silhouette in the foreground and then like through the car windows you see like all this detail. Uh, It really makes me wonder, like... I think of Toth as soon as I see that stuff. So I'd be curious if uh, kayfabers know of interviews where Miller talks about Alex Toth. I'd be curious to check that out. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What is out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness should both be in comic shops whenever you see this. Track those down. It's my retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, perfect for longtime Hulk fans or first-time comics readers. Uh, pick up that book at your local comic shop. And join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue one, two, and potentially issue three are on the stands as we speak. Every issue completely self-contained. Murder on the dark web for fun and profit is the name of the game in the Red Room universe. Banned in 26 countries. Banned in 10 comic shops. But guess what, man? If you know the secret handshake, uh, you talk to those comic shops, they're still going to order you your comics. They're just not going to talk about it to their uh, to their friends. Uh, you can read these comics on my Patreon today, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. More than 200 pages worth of strips are up there as we speak. Hit up my link so you can get to all those destinations to order a pre-order and read these comics. What else do we have, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Dude, give them those marching orders. We'll be on our way. Read more comics.